Thank you, Rick. Good afternoon to all of you. Hope you all had a great week. We had a great time last week. Uh, but I first want to thank you, get a sign of thank you out to the Hymn Octet. Uh, that was really a great job. You guys did a wonderful time, and I really hope we get to hear you more in the future. It's a beautiful piece of music to sing for us. Well, we had a really nice time last week at the Women's Enrichment Weekend in Southern California. Uh, we went down on Friday and we came back Sunday night. Almost 120 women from around the country, including Hawaii, gathered for this exciting and inspiring and rewarding weekend. It was quite, quite moving. Uh, as you know, I was asked to give the sermon down there last Sabbath, and it was a thrill to do it. As I told the ladies when I got up in front of them, it's a little intimidating to stand in front of 120 women when you're not one of them. <laughs> uh, but it was really a great time. Uh, the theme for the weekend was preparing for the winds of change. When you start digging into the subject of change, it's actually very fascinating and a stimulating subject to look into. I actually found myself, as I was preparing for the sermon, extracting items and pieces of information, and I had so much material, <clears throat> I had enough material to give a one-day seminar on the subject. So I had to boil it down and focus on the spiritual side and bring it down to a sermon-level kind of presentation. It really did get me excited. But I had to re rein myself in and try to look at the spiritual side of what I call this all-inclusive subject and very important subject of life. <clears throat> so I thought what I would do is take that sermon and adopt it today and adapt it for you and deliver it here feed, uh, because the feedback that I got after the sermon last Sabbath was pretty uh, overwhelming, to be honest about it. Uh, the comments that were made were just not, never ending. And from what I understand, all the presentations that were made that afternoon and all that night and all day, the next day, every single presentation re referred to the sermon. Uh, that's how much of an impact it had on everybody's life. As we get into the sermon, let me first ask you to do something, though. If you're holding something in your lap, please put it aside, even if it's your Bible or a pen or anything else. If you've got anything that you're being distracted by, put it away. And then what I'd like all of us to do is fold our arms like this. And I want everybody to do this. Fold your arms. Come on, fold your arms. Hold it there for about 10 seconds. Okay, now unfold them. Now I want you to refold them the exact opposite of the way you folded them. If you had right hand over left, left hand over right, you've got to do the exact opposite. You can take them apart now. How did it feel when I asked you to cross the arms the other way? Did it come naturally? Or did you have to stop and think about what am I going to do next? Were you uncomfortable with doing this differently than you did it the first time? Because if you did it like I do, left hand over right, I had to stop and think, now how do I make this feel comfortable with the right hand over left? Isn't it interesting that something as simple as crossing or folding our arms can create a little degree of discomfort. To, to begin with today, I want you to flip over to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. If you can't find that, then maybe you should go home. <laughs> That's got to be one of the easiest books of the Bible to find. <laughs> I want to look at something very well known by all of us, that may help us understand this whole concept of dealing with change in our lives. As you're turning to Genesis 1, let me share a cute story with you about change. Recently, as most of you know, our son Joseph and his wife Ariel had their first child, a baby, boy, baby girl. Baby Chevelle was born on November 26th, so she was two months old last Sabbath when I gave this presentation. When they got home from the hospital, they had to go through the adjustments and adaptations and all the things that new parents have to do. Most of us were not trained to be parents. It just happens. And they had to adopt the, the, pra the practices that they needed to make that all work. Both of them had a lot of learning to do and adjusting to do, as many of you in this room have experienced in your own life. The story is not about them, but here's a cute little story. After bringing their first baby home from the hospital, 
The wife suggested to her husband that he try his hand at changing diapers. I'm busy, he said. I'll do the next one. The next time the baby was wet, she asked if he was ready to learn how to change diapers. He gave her a puzzled look, then said, finally, I didn't mean the next diaper, I meant the next baby. <laughs> Some of us guys are like that. <laughs> but many of us are like that when it comes to changing anything in our own lives. I'll do the next one. The way we look at or perceive the whole concept of change can have an impact on many aspects of our lives. Okay, let's look at Genesis 1 and see how everything began. Let's begin in Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a time when the heavens and the earth did not exist. But God changed that and created them both. But something happened that changed his creation that was perfect and turned it into chaotic. This was prompted by Lucifer's rebellion, which changed what God had created. Let's continue, verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Called, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, so the evening and morning were the first day. God then changed this chaos and confusion into something inhabitable for his ultimate creation, which was coming, man. It started with light. It was dark everywhere, so God changed that and created light. He even changed the situation so that the light, there was a light in the day and there was a darkness at night. He then, in verses 6 through 8, separated the waters of the heavens and the waters of the earth. He changed it all so that the earth could now have earth and we would have something also that we call the sky now. Then in verses 9 and 10, he changed the status or the form of the waters of the earth and established dry land or earth, the earth that we live on today, and the seas. And in verses 11 and 12, he then changed the earth so now... This earth that he created now had grass growing on it, herbs growing on it, fruit trees growing on it. He changed the look. He changed how it was operating. Then in verses 13 through 19, God changed what was the sky or firmament and added the sun for daylight and the moon for night, as well as all the stars. They were not existing prior to that moment. One of the reasons that he made these changes was to divide the day from the night as well as for signs for days, weeks, months, and years, which were going to be important for his ultimate creation, mankind, keeping track of time. He then went back to the waters and the sky in verses 20 through 23 and changed these two aspects of the earth again, adding sea creatures and birds. Now there is life on the earth. Then for the remainder of the chapter, he goes back to the dry land of the earth, and he makes a huge change. This time he adds cattle and wild animals and smaller creatures that run along on the ground, as well as man, whom he made in his own image. Then he made another huge change from the previous six days, and he rested on the seventh day and made it holy. He created the Sabbath. At some point, he realized that man was alone, so he made yet another change. He put the man to sleep, took one of his ribs, and made a woman out of the man. And I told the ladies at the weekend that that's why we can now have a women's enrichment weekend, because man created a woman. Now let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. The changes that God was involved with didn't end there in Genesis with creation. Later, we had the Noatian flood 
that destroyed all of mankind and all living creatures except for those that were on the ark. All that he created, he got rid of it all. So God had changed the entire face of the earth all over again. Now it's totally covered with water. He later changed man's ability to communicate at the Tower of Babel and confounded all the languages that hadn't happened prior to that moment. And the changes go on and on and on all throughout the Bible. God and Jesus Christ are all about change. And it's not ending. But why is this constant and continuous change taking place? Let's see what Paul says here in Romans chapter 12, and maybe we can begin to answer that question. Let's begin in Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what God basically expects from all of us. And then he goes on in verse 2 and he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There are two interesting Greek words here, which are translated transformed and renewing in the New King James in verse 2. The Greek word translated transformed in verse 2 is metamorphouo. Metamorphouo. It's spelled M E T A M O R P H O O in English. And this word means to change by a metamorphosis, which actually means, pay attention to this part, a very noticeable and striking change in appearance or character by supernatural means. Something that is obvious. And the Greek word that is translated renewing in verse 2 is anakonoisis. Anakonoisis. And this word means to renovate. A few years ago, we decided to make some changes in our kitchen. We had counter tile that was very dated, and our floor was hardwood, which is not good in a kitchen, we found out. None of our appliances matched. They were all functional, but not very appealing to the eye. So we initiated a renovation project, and we basically changed everything. Paul is essentially telling us we need to noticeably change everything, especially the way we act and the way we think. You've heard me preaching about this for quite some time now, about we can't really change anything in our lives unless we change the way we think. We have to think differently, as we're going to find out today, about everything. Everything in our life. Turn now to Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. Right after Timothy. As you turn to Titus 3, let me share a quote with you that I found, which is purported to be from Albert Einstein. This is his quote. The world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed which, without changing our thinking. And again, this is what Paul is telling us about our minds. We need to change the way we think. I'm convinced that we need to change the way we think about virtually everything. And I do mean everything. Another quote about changing our thinking is from a man named Peter Senge. Peter is what is called a systems scientist. 
He essentially studies the way people and organizations can make effective changes. Here's the quote from Peter Senge. People don't resist change. They resist being changed. Isn't that true about us too? Most of us don't like to be told what to do or that we need to change. Even when it's God and Jesus Christ telling us to make those changes. The human mind does not respond favorably to that. Let's listen to Paul again here in Titus 3, see what he says about this subject again. Let's begin in Titus 3 and verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey to be ready for every good work. And folks, that's what our lives are to be now. Making sure we are ready for anything that God or Jesus Christ choose to throw our way. Because they are going to do that. Sometimes the things they choose to throw our way are very exciting, very encouraging, very uplifting, very fun and enjoyable. Sometimes they throw things our way that aren't so pleasant. And I believe some of the reasons that they do that is that because they know we will never change this particular aspect of our lives without this discomfort. They know what it's going to take to get us to change. Ready for any change that may be introduced to our lives or any change asked of us. Then he tells us how we can accomplish this. This is interesting, verse 2. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable. To be gentle. Showing all humility to all men. This is all inclusive. In other words, a change from what normally comes natural to us as human beings. As we've been learning about, in our first two sermons on the agape love concept. Verse 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. This This is a list of what normally takes place in the life of an individual. And if you'll be honest with ourselves, all of us have probably fallen into virtually every aspect of those conditions. It's a natural way for a human being to react in an environment, in a world that is being influenced as heavily as it is by Satan. That is, before there was a spiritual metamorphosis or renovation or dramatic change in our lives. And that's part of what we are focusing on today in the sermon. I'm going to read the next four verses from the New Living Translation, as I believe it helps in understanding the depth of what Paul is telling us. You might want to just listen along. Verse 4. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, and this love is the agape love that we've been looking at, that only exists in the realm of Christianity, as I mentioned earlier. We are looking at this incredible agape love, which only comes from God and Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, which we are going to continue studying next week. This is a very unique kind of love, as we've already started to learn. It only comes from God, it only comes from Jesus Christ, and it's only empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't exist in any other religion on the planet. I'm going to read verse 4 again, and then listen to how the New Living Translation puts verse 5. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life, through the Holy Spirit. And the terms translated regeneration and renewing here in the King James Version and the New King James Version and others is the same one from Romans 12. 
which we saw means to be renovated or completely changed. There's an obvious change that has taken place. Obvious and striking. And as the New Living Translation puts it, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. We are talking about a complete transformation, a complete change in life. Verse 6, he generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Brethren, these are words to live by, to think about, so we can allow this change or this metamorphosis to take place in each and every one of our lives. I mean, we've all talked about it. We've even maybe heard sermonettes or even heard it mentioned in sermons in years gone by, where the speaker has used the analogy of the caterpillar and butterfly. A caterpillar, which walks along on the ground, crawls along with gazillions of little legs and feet, goes through a metamorphosis over a period of time, and a complete change takes place. And when it pops out of that pupa or cocoon, it goes in a caterpillar, it comes out a butterfly. That's what God wants. God is expecting that dramatic and striking of a change in each and every one of us. Before we're done today, hopefully we'll see that this spiritual renovation project, if you will, must take place first if we ever expect to be able to properly handle the physical changes and the physical challenge of this life. It won't work. Let's turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. And the more I studied this, the more I realized that this metamorphosis, the spiritual change has to take place so that I can handle the challenges in this physical life. And when this change does start to take place, the way I approach and address these changes in life, these physical changes in life, become more manageable. They don't get us as worked up. And we have more confidence that what comes out the other end is going to be good, as opposed to worry and fretting and fearing. And it's for the good, the bad, or the indifferent, it doesn't matter what the changes are in our lives. We can't even really truly appreciate a quality change in our lives unless we've had this Spiritual metamorphosis take place already in our minds and in our hearts. And I might add that agape love I referred to, which we just read about, is the key to a more peaceful and joyful way of life. One reason is it takes the attention off of us and puts the attention on people around us, no matter who those people are. And it really doesn't matter who they are as we have started to learn, and as we are going to learn in the agape love sermons. God expects us to learn how to express this agape love, not just to somebody that is lovable, as I mentioned in my last sermon, but to any human being on this planet. That's a tough challenge, isn't it? I hear regularly in discussions with people, and I've had this happen to me ever since I was ordained back in the mid-70s. Discussions that I've had with people, how they'd like to see this or that changed, especially in other people. I think the biggest complaint or criticism I hear from individuals within the church is about other people. I don't think, I know. And that's a sad fact. And it's been that way ever since I can remember in the ministry. Mahatma Gandhi was once quoted as saying, be the change that you wish to see in the world. What a great 
and godly piece of advice. Let's now look at Ephesians 4 and see what else Paul had to say on this subject. Let's begin in Ephesians 4 and verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. He was speaking to a Gentile city in Ephesus. But this is also discussing all ungodly behavior in any human being, which he was telling them and telling us they needed to change. But he goes on in verse 20, he says, But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This word translated renewed in verse 23 is not the same Greek word as before used, but it also means to renovate and to reform or to completely change. Paul is using every possible approach he can use to try to get us to know and understand. And when you go back into the Greek words, he's trying it from different angles just to make sure that everybody knows you really do have to change. And as we're beginning to see, not just change something, change everything. And if you will be honest with yourself, as I've tried to be with myself of recent months, look at everything in your life differently. You can't just keep thinking about the way you're doing things, the way you've always done it, and expect to have any transformation take place. It's not going to happen. Just like when I asked you to fold your arms. Simple, simple, simple step. Then I asked you to refold them another way, and you had to stop, think, which one was on top, which one was on the bottom, how do I get the top one to be on the bottom and the bottom one to be on top? Folks, that's the only way these kinds of changes are going to take place in our lives. We have to stop, look at whatever it is, and ask ourselves, how do I make that change? How do I transform differently? in the future? How do I think differently about this in the future? The only way you can do that is with the power of God's Holy Spirit. This is what things that Paul, that Paul's trying to tell us here and show us here. Again, Paul is utilizing every form of communication to get his point across about this absolutely necessary transformation in our lives. And I don't care how long we've been in the church, I don't care where we've ever accomplished in the church, whether we're ordained or not ordained, it it doesn't matter. I still think all of us, every single one of us, have to change everything the way we think about it. Then in verse 24, he tells us to put on the new nature or person that was created in us at baptism, requiring a metamorphosis, or as we also saw, a supernatural change. It does not happen by accident. And it doesn't doesn't happen by just being there. It is something we have to consciously make the effort to do. Let's look at another of Paul's comments about our Christian lives next in 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. we'll see yet more discussion about the change, transformation, and renewing that is expected to take place. Some people don't want to accept or acknowledge their need for change. A story is told about a doctor who told a man to give up red meat, so he stopped putting ketchup on his hamburgers. 
we've all learned there's a loophole. And if we can just stick to the letter of the law, we're okay. It doesn't work that way. Not even close. We have learned in other messages that God, in fact, uses trials, as I alluded to earlier, and challenges to make us make the adjustments or changes in our lives. Changes apparently that we won't or can't make on our own. And I believe that's what preparing for the upcoming Passover season is all about. As I've said for years, eventually all of us will go through some kind of dramatic event in our life. And some changes and spiritual transformations are going to be forced to, make, to take place. So God and Jesus Christ can get us to where they want us to be. Where they know we can be where they have plans for us to be and know that we can get there. Here in 2 Corinthians 3, we'll see the idea of the veil that Moses put on his face after he came down off the mountain after speaking to God so that the children of Israel couldn't see his glorified face, which was terrifying them. I mean, you can just imagine. Some guy goes up on the mountain, you know him. He comes down from the mountain, he's glowing. That'd freak anybody out. They were afraid when they saw his skin glow after being in the presence of God. The glory of God living in us, God's Holy Spirit, has no veil covering it up because of Jesus Christ. And it should be glowingly apparent too. Let's begin in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 7. Again, I'm going to read this passage from the New Living Translation, so it's going to sound a little different. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. The old way, which laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. So it was more glorious when he was up on the mountain with God, and the days it took him to come down, it started to fade. Direct interaction with God, back in the physical sense, caused a change to take place in Moses' face. It had a glow about it. It was obvious to anyone who looked at Moses that he had been in the presence of God. This was a physical transformation, but it didn't last. Verse 8. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving the life? In other words... We should expect a dramatic change to take place in our lives to reflect the glory of God and Jesus Christ once we have God's Spirit living in us. That's exactly what this is telling us. Remember what that word meant earlier, which was a metamorphosis? A very noticeable and striking change in appearance or character by supernatural means. And God and Jesus Christ expect to see that kind of transformation reflected in each and every one of our lives. People should be able to look at us and know there's something different. We should be glowing or reflecting the glory of God. Not just in the way we look, the way we smile, the way we talk, the way we treat, the way we act. Verse 9, if the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, and we just talked about how glorious it was, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? This is still talking about this renovation project going on in our lives. Folks, this is really, really powerful stuff. And I really hope all of us are beginning to get it. Verse 12, since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. 
We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. Our new glory should be able to be seen. Verse 14. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. That physical veil that Moses wore and is translated as a spiritual veil, keeping the people from seeing and really knowing the truth of God. But things have changed now with the addition of Jesus Christ who has opened the way for us. Verse 16. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Dual meaning. The veil is taken away so we can now start understanding everything that God wants us to understand. Secondarily, the veil is taken away and our glory can be witnessed. Our glory can be seen by anybody who looks at us and spends any time with us at all. And everyone, this is the conversion process at which something really dramatic was expected to happen. This took place at baptism in each and every one of our lives. Verse 17, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now listen to the capstone of this whole discussion, if you will, in verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Do we understand what he's telling us here? This is powerful stuff. That metamorphosis is gradually taking place in each and every one of our lives. To the degree that we are making the effort to fold our arms the opposite way we did the first time. How did we do that again? Stopped, thought about it, analyzed what we needed to do different, and then we did it. That has to take place, folks, in every single nook and cranny of our life. And God says it can happen. Through the power of his spirit. Doesn't expect it to happen all at once. That's why that caterpillar goes into the cocoon. How long is he in the cocoon? He's in the cocoon a long time. Why is he in there for such a long time? Because a complete change is taking place. It takes time. So don't get frustrated if you can't make this change dramatically all of a sudden. Work on one thing at a time. Whatever the one thing is that you want to work on. I've given you some suggestions in the last sermon that I gave, just those four or five terms that we used in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 4, 13 and verse 4. Work on one thing for a day, maybe one thing for a week. I can tell you from personal experience, when you start doing this, everything changes. I don't know how to explain it. The way you think about everything starts to change. Just by working on one little thing at a time. And then once you go to one thing, then you go to the second thing, and then the third thing, and then the fourth thing. If you only did one a week, at the end of a year, you're going to change 52 different things in your life. Can you imagine how miraculous of a progress that would be, going from Passover to Passover? I mean, how many times have I asked you, how, is, how are you different this Passover than you were last Passover? It should be dramatically seen and dramatically known and dramatically felt. Let's go to Romans 8 now. Romans 8. God is planning to have us change just as dramatically as the caterpillar to the butterfly. Glorious beings. That's what he's wanting us to become. 
What Paul is trying to tell us here is that there's a huge change or renovation that is taking place in our lives. The moment we said we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and asked God to forgive us of our sins and repented of our sins, came out of that water and had hands laid on us, something sparked inside of us spiritually. That little tiny speck was there, and God wanted it to start growing. I've told you before, I've baptized many people through the years. There's been very few of the ones I've baptized that I've seen a dramatic change take place. Most, you don't even notice. That's not judging somebody, that's observing the reality of life. And that is unbelievably sad. It's taken me, what, 50 some years to finally start getting the point. So God's patient, thankfully. But once we start getting the point, he wants us to do something with it. God and Jesus Christ are transforming us from one type of person to something very special. And they will use every means power, power to, powerful to them to bring it about. It doesn't matter. Including allowing and also causing physical changes in our lives as motivators to bring this transition about. God will allow us to make stupid mistakes that he could intervene on so that we can make the mistake, suffer the pain, and have to make a change. God will allow something from the outside to come into our lives and cause us trauma so that we have to deal with it, feel the pain of it, make the change to get out of it so that the changes can take place. This can be very exciting. It can also be a bit daunting at times. The key to success here, I believe, is to come to the point where we actually, actually believe that God and Jesus Christ are in control of our lives, not us. We're going to see here in Romans 8 that everything that happens to us in life will ultimately work out for the good. Whether it's self-induced, which happens a lot of the times, whether it's God-induced, or whether it's just allowed to happen, they are going to renovate us into something simply glorious. It is the renovation project of the ages, if you will. Let's begin in Romans 8 and verse 28. We all know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And that goes for any change that may come about in our lives. God's going to make it all good, ultimately. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. It's a process. And it's going to take our entire life to get us there. The ultimate transformation or renovation, if you will, will take place when we are finally changed into the actual image of Jesus Christ. We will be in full glory just as he is. So we get ready to wrap it up here today. Let's turn over to John 17. John chapter 17. We will be transformed to be just like Jesus Christ. Like I said a little bit ago, a renovation project for the ages, if you will. Here in John 17, as part of the prayer that Jesus Christ prayed to the Father prior to his capture, torture, and crucifixion. This was an intensely heartfelt prayer between him and his Father. For his disciples then and for us now. Here we will see Christ basically putting a finishing touch on what we just read in Romans 8. Let's pick it up in John 17 and verse 20. John 17, verse 20. 
Christ was praying and he said, I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And as we've heard before, heard before this is talking about us. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, and are, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. He's talking about this change taking place. He's talking about this renovation, this enormous change in people's lives. Verse 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. And there's more spiritual change coming. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And again, again, I mentioned that this transformation has everything to do with this agape love of God in Jesus Christ. These kinds of changes don't take place in our human lives without this kind of love being exercised by us. Up to and including loving our enemies. And that weird means enemies. Somebody would love to kill you. Hope all of us can see that the spiritual renovation which is taking place in our lives is actually key to our being able to handle, cope with, and ultimately benefit from any physical changes taking place that we may face in this physical life. That whole process and principle to have that glorious privilege to address and discuss like those ladies had last week. And they talked about it all week long, all weekend long. We need to be talking about stuff like this all the time. When we get together with one another, when we go to dinner with one another, when we go to lunch with one another, we have each other over at our homes, when we go for a walk, we go for a bike ride. This kind of stuff doesn't just happen. It happens because we folded our arms one way and we had to stop and think, how do I make it go the other way? If we're willing to do that, why wouldn't we be willing to look at our lives and say, well, what do I need to change and how do I change it? And then go to God and ask God for the power and the strength and the ability to be able to accomplish it. Let me leave you with this anonymous quote. Your change can make a change. Have a great Sabbath.